my name is Magnus Eriksson and I come from Minsa Solutions. It's a company in Sweden that focuses mainly on um, research funders and uh, our focus is in medical research. Um, we have gotten uh, the, uh, the question from the medical founders that they would like to have a database or something to uh, measure <coughs> Uh, the clinical impact of the research they fund. And as a response to that, we created the Clinical Impact Database. It is a specialized citation database, and we have currently processed over um, 1.2 million citations. <coughs> but to understand the impact, we have to recognize the context of citations. It is important because less than half of the cited material is actually included and used in the recommendation. Uh, about one quarter of the cited material is excluded, uh, often because of faulty um, study design or other uh, reasons they don't match the inclusion criteria. Another quarter of the cited material is the so-called additional references. It's other resources, it's further reading, sometimes even patient literature. Another important aspect of the uh, citations in uh, clinical guidelines is that there are different updating frequencies for different guidelines. Some guidelines are updated very seldomly, maybe once every tenth year. Other uh, guidelines are updated very frequently, sometimes several times within a single year. By, by analyzing a set of guidelines, the guidelines uh, on cancer from the Norwegian Health Directorate, we have found that around 73% of citations are recurring between the different editions of guidelines. The guidelines in that set was updated roughly every two years between the year 2007 and 2018. The conclusion in this is that the pure number of citations in clinical guidelines can produce an artificially high number. Um, so you have to study the context of the citations as I said, if less than half of the citations are used in, in, in the basis of the recommendation, one have to, has to <laughs> find those and not mix them up with all the excluded material. Uh, and also, uh, guidelines that are updated very frequent, frequently, you have to use them or process them in a, in a different way to keep track of the different editions. So, for example, if we have one uh, paper that's cited in a guideline that's updated once every tenth year. And you have another article that's cited in a guideline that's updated two times a year. If you don't keep track of the different editions, you will get an unusually high number on the uh, paper that's cited in the m frequently updated one. Oh, <laughs> we keep track of that. Yeah, if I was not speaking clearly, please go to my poster and talk to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am here in behalf of Patricio Cortez uh, from Pontificia Universidade Católica of Chile. Uh, he also could be um, could attend this conference, so I try to do my uh, best to represent him. So I'm I'm going to. Um, read the notes that he sent me. Uh, uh, his research is about outmetrics analysis of open access scholarly research headed by Lat Latin American institutions from 2009 to 2018 around uh, SDG. Uh, three, good health and well-being. Within the context of the open access movement led in Latin America by Cielo LA Reference and others, plus new international frameworks such as Plan S, uh, a greater commitment to diversify access to quality research and impact has been evident. Therefore, it is relevant to identify how the research of the period understood is disseminated, promoted and used in open access and other types of access led by Latin American institutions regarding critical issues of global interest, su such as the pandemic uh, H1N1, uh, included uh, at in the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, three, health and uh, wellness. 
the H1N1 uh, pandemic is a viral virus never identified as a cause uh, of human infections before 2009. After that, f uh, 74 countries have not notified confirmed infections through uh, laboratory tests. Uh, Patricio did uh, a study considered three worki working phases. The phase ones, uh, he collected citable publications such as article reviews uh, and conference papers. Uh, were retrieved from journal indexed in Scopus database with specific subject areas linked to OECD discipline, uh, medical and health science, uh, which allowed generate a framework recover research addressing uh, H1N1. In phase two, uh, select a publication where the corresponding author would be affiliated with a Latin America country according to the definition of these indicators. Leadership indicators the amount of production of an institution as the main contributor, that's, that's it. The amount of documents uh, in which the corresponding author belongs to the institution. Okay, so I will try to, to go to the, the results. Uh, he uh, divided in three main questions. Uh, the first question, is it advantage uh, to publish critical issues led by Latin America in open access for disseminating on social platform and how does it impact public policies? He found uh, a really le relevant uh, result that uh, the the open access it's uh, important for this uh, kind of uh, publication he also tried to see if there is a technological transfer of this publication and he didn't uh, um, find any evidence about that and uh, uh, he also tried to respond uh, if there are uh, researchers uh, used to sustain or generate new researchers and uh, a few conclusions um, it's related to the open access uh, the high impact of uh, dissertations uh, and all the information unfortunately I don't have more time for this but uh, uh, there is uh, we can share his contact uh, with you if you have uh, um, interest in any question thank you yes that's it okay so um, again, Charlotte Spinner, AARP, Washington, DC. I'm afraid I can't avoid the Fifty Shades reference because <laughs> my entire poster is built around that theme. Um, but <laughs> um, you may wonder why, uh, but we, we deal with the age 50 population, age 50 and older. So that's, um, that's where the, that hook comes from. But um, we've been finding our work, as I mentioned earlier, um, let's see, this was just a brief re recap of AARP, brief recap of AARP research, um, studying the needs, market conditions, and trends impacting the 50 plus population. So we've been working hard to pull together not only what we've done to promote and communicate our research, as I mentioned this morning, but also the res resulting reach assembled together in our newly developed impact reports that I showed you. Um, and I'll provide a demo of um, the dynamic impact report to anyone um, who'd like to see it during the social hour coming next. So what have we learned so far? Um, and this is a, a screen capture from the, um, uh, in from the poster. So what have we learned so far? So this is, this is where the Fifty Shades hook comes in. Um, we kept noticing when we first started doing analysis of altmetric data and other data we gathered, is that the same studies kept getting referenced over and over and over again, and they seemed to have these um, very uh, palatable, easily digestible and understandable hooks in the media. So I coined these sexy data points, which kind of everyone at the office sort of seized on that term. So <laughs> um, but they're bite-sized, they're easy to understand, and yet very compelling. So um, for example, we have an age discrimination data point of, um, three out of four, I'm sorry, 61% of US adults have either seen or experienced age discrimination in the workplace. That's huge, it's a huge number. And so there's been a lot written about that. Um, also our Bigfoot stat, um, nearly three in 10 people think it's more likely they're going to learn that Bigfoot is real than they're going to be able to retire 
and save enough money to be able to retire. So um, that was a study that we did with a, a, a list of many outlandish things that people feel are more likely than being able to retire comfortably. Um, the second surprise is that as the age of some of our data that's still being shared frequently, uh, we didn't expect that. Uh, but what we realized is that if the topic's relevant today, it doesn't really matter if the data are a few years old. And our web department, who doesn't really understand our research, keeps telling us, you know, some of this is two years old. We've got to take it down. And <laughs> we recoil in horror at that. And um, so this has helped us argue for keeping our data alive on our site um, to be continued to, to, to be shared. And this also tells us where we need to put our resources to update these topics of interest. We've had quite a bit of interest in a 2010 loneliness study. It was quoted two times in the New York Times in 2018. So later in 2018, we repeated the study also to, to great pick up um, many citations. The third surprise, um, the diversity of the outlets using and sharing our findings on their websites and social media accounts um, in policy documents, journal articles, we do get cited in professional journals, um, which we didn't realize. Trade, is, trade publications, retail sites, even um, legislator pages and legislative deb debate testimony, such as some testimony to the United States Senate that quoted our research. So, sorry. Ah, all of these uh, takeaways tell us that the work does have broad reach and it does have real impact. And that's important because we're trying to become the Pew Research of the 50 plus population. So we feel like getting this data and seeing our um, name frequently paired with this compelling data will help us achieve that. And also will help inform our future um, efforts so that we can be even more impactful over time. Thank you. Okay, and this is my post. <laughs> Um, I represent uh, the San Matteo General Teaching Hospital Italy. By the way, I'm also an Armetric Ambassador, co founder of Sigmet Group's European uh, Association of Health Informational Libraries, and I fell in love with Almetrics. As we know, the problem of measuring the scientific and social impact of research publication has been uh, of extreme interest to scientific We also are to answer in this new scenario. For example, how to help our researcher with data? Of course, with courses, training, help in completed CV, or something new. How to use the data for the institution compared with the traditional methods? Which are the clinics that get the most attention and the meter score? Which are the research are most attractive, maybe for founding grounds? So have, we have an idea. We collected the scientific production of the year 2011 to 2018, about 5,000 items of our hospital. With FileMaker 11 software, we created a database that collects citation and all metrics of all research articles produced by our researchers. We retrieve citation of each article from Web of Science and Scopus databases. By PMID ID and the OI of each publication, we obtain each one score on Almetric.com. Launching the update, the system is able to connect to Web of Science, to Scopus, to Armetri.com. Data can be broken by year, department, or unit. We assess the correlation between Almetric citation counts and traditional indices. And also, having the impact factor each publication, we have a complete picture of the impact of our scientific output. In fact, good correlation between the metrics and traditional metrics are observed, and the high percentage of paper on Almetric score. Some departments had unexpected good Almetric score compared to the additional citation. This could be a sign of particular interest of patient and patient organization. Our institutes every year promotes course and the user on the use of use social media for researcher with a great attendance, as you see in the photo. In conclusion, Almetri School contribute to the creation of value and give a more complete co perspective on the important question of the democratization of evaluation. It can represent an austerity and complement to citation. In particular, we would like to explore the possibility combining the Almetris to traditional indicators in a multidimensional model to assess the impact of scientific works over a given period of time and assess reliability of such complex model. 
Of course, librarian may become the link between the world of a matrix, researcher, and institution. Thank you. All right, listservs as filters. So I wanted to look at listservs to see if there was um, more data that we can mine for altmetrics, which I call altmetrics 1.0. And so I looked at SIGMET, ARI, AIRL, and SCALCOM. And you could see that uh, they all have different ranges of when they existed and when they ended. And SIGMET is a special case in that the main list moved to Google for w after 2018 and then actually moved to ACES, and it's a closed community, so it's kind of a pain to get the data. So what I did was I took uh, the most common dates from 2004 to 2017, and I scraped all of these listserv archives. And you can see that I had uh, around 7,000 messages for SIGMET, um, 34,000 for AIRL, and 7,827 for SCALCOM. And then I wrote a bunch of code. And so I wanted to scrape DOIs, URLs, ISSNs to um, hopefully academic resources, but of course there were URLs to everything. Um, but what, what I got, uh, you know, I have around eight and a half thousand DOIs from SIGMET, only a thousand DOIs from AIRL, and 396 DOIs from SCALCOM. And you can see the breakdown on the fight on data chart. So the processing has taken the most amount of time. This is why probably you and Altmetrics haven't tackled this yet, because I have um, talked about this as a data source for a long time, and they keep saying, well, it's difficult, and now I know that it really is quite difficult. <laughs> um, so I use Python and PHP. Uh, Python handles dates time, uh, date times with time zones really poorly, so I had to move over to PHP to handle time zones, because all of these listservs have the time zone attached to the date, and it's a real pain in the butt, and uh, um, I used MySQL, and MySQL doesn't handle date times with time zones either uh, very well, so in future work, I'm gonna move to Postgres, because it actual han actually handles time zones quite well. Uh, you see the red reg X's, uh, regular expressions that I've used. Um, uh, Crossref was nice enough to post a blog post about how to identify DOIs, uh, so I'm using their red reg X for this. Uh, the reason I want to do this is because, you know, the original Altmetrics manifesto talked about Altmetrics as filters. So these trusted sources of information where we could find, you know, new articles, new books, etc. And I think listservs are a, a great place for that aspect. Um, I don't know if we still would consider listservs as Altmetrics, but I consider, consider them social enough because there are replies to emails. There's some sort of interaction going on. Um, and uh, another thing, uh, reason that I did this is because of what we would consider academic impact. So we're all really interested in social impact um, these days and how to measure that. And it's a real pain to uh, first, uh, first of all, define it, but um, and then try to measure it in some meaningful way. But I think it's easier to re measure academic impact. And most of these listservs are um, have members from academia. Oh, good. And so future work, I'm going to keep cleaning the data. I'm going to organize my code and post it up on GitHub once I get all this working and publish the clean data sets, so which will be in relational database tables. And then expand the listserv collection to other fields, examine citations before and after the DOIs are present in the emails, so to see if there's any sort of citation impact, and then examine self-citations because a lot of people in listservs post their own work. So here's a new article I wrote, et cetera. So that's it. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Davina. I am the librarian for scholarly communication at Royal Roads University in British Columbia. And uh, the research question I am taking a look at um, looks at how academic libraries are using alt metrics to showcase attention and engagement to research um, in their institutional repositories. And so um, uh, at Royal Roads, we do have uh, plum uh, metrics in our repository, We're trying to figure out what we might do with that, what insights it can give us, and so um, looking at the literature to see how other libraries might be uh, using altmetrics in this way. Uh, so some of the key themes um, that came out of that review and that I speak to in the poster are around uh, knowledge mobilization, contextualizing traditional metrics, and uh, recruiting content. Uh, so first off, knowledge mobilization. So taking a look at um, what that altmetric data can tell us about whether or not that research in the repository is actually being used or maybe um, if there's some engagement with that research, um, 
that is getting into the hands of policymakers or decision makers. So not just, um, you know, there were like mentions or tweets, but um, can we can we look into that um, a bit further to figure out if, um, you know, if it's being mentioned in the news, for example, or are, um, you know, lay people type thing, like are they speaking about, about that research? How is that knowledge being mobilized? And how are the researchers taking that, um, taking that information and communicating it in a way that makes sense to non-academic audiences and can altmetrics tell us anything about whether or not it's been communicated effectively to non-academic audiences so that it can be used in things like policy or be used um, by the public or have some type of um, impact in society in some way. Uh, the next one is to con contextualize metrics. So most of the repositories uh, that I looked at have things like download counts and usage statistics, uh, page views, things like that. But I'm um, just taking a look at whether libraries are using altmetrics to give them any more insight or really to just paint a bigger, paint a, um, a more comprehensive picture of the type of engagement um, that that research is receiving and uh, whether or not um, that research is being effectively showcased in a way. So can they contextualize metrics with um, these types of more traditional metrics with all metrics and then use that um, in kind of the larger picture um, to really say that the, these are kind of the institutional successes of, um, of, of that research. And then the last one is content recruitment. Uh, so, um, giving altmetrics and feeding um, altmetrics to um, scholars and to researchers who are putting their work in the repository and kind of having that as a value added service uh, to uh, show them how uh, their research is being um, engaged with. So can we actually get more researchers to deposit their work in the repository? Can we, um, can we advocate, can we use this as a way to advocate for op more openly available research using r the repository as a service? And can altmetrics um, encourage scholars to want to deposit their work in the repository and I was just taking a look at how some libraries are doing that to show them the value of having that work um, in the repository specifically. Hi, I'm Neus Milan. Uh, I'm a research librarian at Universidad Oberta de Catalunya. It's an online university in Barcelona. And in WOC we are exploring uh, new ways uh, to evaluate uh, research in a more responsible manner in line with the recommendations of the DORA declaration. All metrics are presented as a possible alternative metrics for analyzing the social impact of research. In this sense, WOG decided to run a pilot last 2018 uh, to analyze the impact of its scientific output on social media and figure out if all metrics could be an effective way to improve research visibility beyond academia or whether all metrics should be a complementary way to uh, evaluate research publication or not. And how did we carry out our pilot? First of all, uh, we analyzed the social impact of the works articles uh, from our CRIS system, published in 2016 and 17 with DOI and using with Webometric Analyst Tool. On the other hand, we tried to detect possible factors that could raise visibility of scientific output. Uh, so we wanted to answer quens questions such as, does publishing in quarter one or uh, two in in journal ranks increase the attention received on social media, or uh, articles without the impact factor could use social media as an effective channel for scientific communication, or does open access publishing really improve visibility? But we also analyze articles with highest almetric attention score related to citations received, subject category and open access. And finally, we compare work social impact in relation to other online universities. Although we are, we are aware that our study is biased because of the small sample, because we just retrieve all metrics from articles with DOI, we want to share some of the conclusions uh, of the work case. We consider that it's too early to use all metrics for research ev evaluation, especially because it doesn't exist a standardization methodology, neither a general consensus. Social media reach beyond the academy and rise with the visibility of publications that don't, don't have impact factor, such as arts and humanities or law disciplines. In work, 25% uh, of our articles with all metrics uh, don't have impact factor. But on the contrary, publishing in quarter one or two journals seem to guarantee greater impact on social media. In this case, at work, 75% of our articles 
with all metrics are uh, in quartiles one and two. And in the case of work, articles with the highest on metric attention score are open access and from the field of health sciences. But in general terms, we saw that the open access doesn't mean more visibility. And finally, there is no direct link between the level of attention on social media and the citations received from other scientific works. Well, we think that of our small pilot uh, could be of your interest because it's something different, uh, practical case study in an online university. Please come join me later uh, to see our poster and we could talk in more detail about our metrics pilot. Thank you very much. And to speak for all of these lovely people here at the University Library of uh, the University of Southern Denmark. And I'd like to talk to you about our small project on how to color in the altmetric donut. Now, I know that many of you actually work for Altmetric, and many more of you are very well versed in how the Altmetric donut works. But imagine, if you will, for a moment, if you're just um, a normal researcher, and from one day to the next, on your institu institutional website, this donut appears next to all of your um, newest outfits, right? And so, as you can well imagine, our library was f uh, completely flooded with all sorts of questions. OK, there was no flood but we certainly did receive some. And <laughs> among them were, you know, there's this number here. Um, on, on, on all of my publications, I have a one. So does that mean that I'm the best? Or for instance, I have all these colors. Do I want more colors? Do I want less colors? What do all these things mean? But the most important one for, for us was, I see this number. Is this something that I can trust? And uh, in, in our opinion, any metric that can be measured, it can obviously also be gamed. So to try and address this, um, we sent in an, uh, an editorial to Library Quarterly, where we asked our, our um, other librarians to, to, to kind of crowdsource and help us to tweet and like and, 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 and do all of the normal interactions that would be followed by Altmetric with this DOI. And then the idea was that we want to track and, and see if simple nudging will be one method to, to try and boost your own altmetric score. And as you can see, we've had some moderate success. And But basically, I'd like to invite you all to come over to our poster, um, perhaps have a drink and have a chat. And then um, I'd be very I interested to hear how the altmetric donut is used at your institute. And if you have any feelings on how I could better explain to our researchers how they can use this in their own work. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ji Chao Fang from the CWTS of Leiden University. Uh, in our study, we did a recheck on the status of Twitter mentions recorded by Autometric.com to see how many Twitter mentions have become unavailable or inaccessible to the public over time. We selected over 2.6 million Twitter mentions of more than 1,000 the most tweeted scientific publications recorded by Autometric.com until October 2017 as our research object. And the tweet IDs of this site of Twitter mentions are collected from automatic.com and are rechecked through the Twitter API in April 2019. Once the tweet ID is not, is not accessible or say is not available, the error code responded by API will be recorded for analysis. So finally, for 2.6 million Twitter mentions, we found about 14.3% of them were unavailable during our data collection. And the deletion of tweets is the major reason for the unavailability. It accounts for uh, over half of the unavailable tweets, followed by suspension and protection of Twitter user accounts. And at the publication level, all selected highly tweeted publications in our data site have a certain share of Twitter mentions unavailable and the proportions are less than 20% for most of them. However, there are some publications with their most majority of Twitter mentions disappeared. For example, the top 10 publications have over 90% of Twitter mentions unavailable, making their Twitter metrics relatively unstable if those unavail unavailable tweets are removed. And in last month, we have finished the recheck for all of the Twitter mentions recorded by automatic.com until 2017. And out of 42.5 million Twitter mentions, 5.5 million have become unavailable. 
uh, accounting for about 13%. So the, this result is quite similar with our small sample research. So in light of this result, we emphasize the importance of paying more attention to the potential risk of unstable Twitter metrics, which might exacerbate the inconsistency among Twitter data recorded by different data aggregators. Um, hi, I'm Luc van Ewijk. I'm a library information specialist for a technical university um, in the Netherlands, the University of Twente. Uh, you probably never heard of it. Um, anyway, um, in this position, uh, I was responsible for the integration or imp implementation of uh, Altmetric Explorer. Um, it's not yet finished, but um, I've been uh, involved all the time. Um, and during this process, I thought maybe it's a nice idea to create a poster about this implementation process and then preferably the ideal uh, implementation process. So then I created this poster and this is uh, partly based on what we did and partly on what we did not do. Um, and it's uh, meant as sort of a conversation piece, so you could look at this and then uh, I would very much like to discuss with you uh, concrete cases. Um, so I will show you how this poster works. Um, this, uh, yeah, whoa, let's go back. So this represents uh, a building. So you work from the solid ground to the rooftop bar, and in, in the end, if you're on the rooftop bar, everything is, uh, well, not everything is organized, but I'll get back to that. Um, <laughs> so um, the solid ground, I'm not gonna explain each phase, I'm just gonna explain to you uh, which pillars I chose to uh, build this um, building. So I involved uh, the management, uh, or you could say strategy and policy, uh, the library and IT as one unit, uh, the researchers of course, uh, marketing and communications, and the funders and publishers. So these are all key players in this process. Um, because at first I was only focusing on the, on the parties that are within, or the players that are within the university, uh, but then I found out that if you don't include funders and publishers in this building um, it's not re really realistic because if you want to m to actually make sure that altmetric is used by researchers then the funders and publishers also play a role in this so you will never finish the building if you don't put that pillar over there um, so then i work my way up I, I come above the ground and you have the entrance support beams the visitor center command center i invite you all to figure out what that means um, and in the end, this one is important, so I will explain. You have the rooftop bar where all the key players come together and they will, uh, it's not finished then, so you've implemented uh, Altmetric Explorer, uh, but you need to uh, have an ongoing um, conversation between uh, the, the key players within the university, but also, also among uh, universities. So that's what's uh, represented here, and I would say that 6 a.m. is a very good example of the rooftop bar that you see here. So let's hope that we can enjoy a conversation after this presentation. <laughs> Thank you.